What is up, my friends? We're so excited that you decided to join us for Youth Online. My name is David Reynolds, and I get to serve on staff here with our high school team. And man, I'm really excited to be with you. Uh, this week, tonight, we are starting a new series. Um, as every February, we start a new series, and we go through different topics uh, such as sex. Yes, I said sex, dating, marriage, relationships, gender, sexuality. And man, this year, as we go into this month of February, it's no different. We're so excited to be jumping into this series today. And we're kicking off, and it's called Imago Dea, which is really what it means is image of God. Now, this term comes from a passage in Genesis 1 when God is creating everything. He finishes creating the universe and the world, and then he creates man. And let's read, pick up in, as God's creating man in verse 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. Now we'll stop there. He's saying us. Now what he means by us is the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we'll get to that another time. But he says us because of that. And he says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So... God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, and God blessed them. Male and female, he created them. Now, what this passage is saying is that every single human being is made in the image of our God. Now, does that mean our God is a human, right? Since we're humans, well, no. God is spirit. Jesus, though, part of the Trinity, is God, though, and came down as a human to die on the cross for us. But it says that God the Father is spirit in John 4. It means God doesn't have a human body. But when he says that he made us in his image, it means in his character, in his holiness, in his love. We are created by God in his image. We are his masterpiece. And throughout the narrative of the Bible, we see that God is so clear on who he wants us to be and how we are to live. Now, when it comes to sex or to marriage, to dating, relationships, gender, sexuality, it is no different. Man, we are called to live as we are created in relationship with God as his image bearers, which is why we have decided to call this series Imago Dea. We pray that over the next few weeks, we will allow the truth that we are made in the image of God to transform how we view all of these topics. And today, man, we're going to kick it off by talking about these two big topics of sexuality and gender. Now, sexuality and gender are two of the hottest topics to talk about today. Our media, culture, education system, YouTube culture have really made these two topics a definer of a generation, your generation. And here's the thing, all of it, from what we watch on TV to what we see on social media, what YouTube culture tells us, all of these avenues are telling you a certain narrative regarding gender and sexuality. A narrative that as we're going to explore today, man, it's not always in line with what God and his words say. Now, as we get into this, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that this isn't something that's a new. It's not a new conversation. It's a conversation that's been prevalent for thousands of years. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes about it in Romans 1, 18 through 22 and 24 through 28, which is what we're going to read. Paul says in Romans 1, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools." Skipping down to verse 24, it says, Therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity or for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served and created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, man, God gave them over to their shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to the depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. 
what first Paul is doing is explaining how God has made himself known in nature and the way he intended nature to be and how in this revelation, though, through nature, we as humans are without excuse. What does that mean? It means as we look around at the way God intended things to be, man, it screams the fact that, he, that there is a God and that this God is good and that he created nature to be good. Paul goes on to explain how the Romans of this time were suppressing the truth. They were exchanging truth for a lie. Women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. Men did the same thing. And what happened? Man, God gave them over to the futility of their minds, and they did what ought not to be done, as it talks about in verse 28. And this is what happens when we suppress the truth of God and exchange it for a lie. Whether it's gender, whether it's sexuality, whether it's other things in life, when we go and we say, God, you know what? I don't want that truth I want the lie. God, God does allow us to do that so that we can see how far off we are. Now, this message for the Rome, of, for, that Paul was writing to the Romans, man, it's not just a message for them thousands of years ago. I think it's really a message for us today here in America. Now, you watching this, Generation Z, man, you are caught in the middle of a massive attempt to redefine basic human nature and the attempts that it would be more inclusive and line up more with what one individual might feel. Think about the changes that even happened in the past seven years. On January 30th, 2017, a landmark decision was announced by the BSA, or rather the Boy Scouts of America, that they, they would now accept and register youth in the club and, and Cub and Boy Scouts program based on their gender identity in, indicated on their application rather than the gender that was assigned at birth. The curriculum inside the public school system, as you know, is changing to now affirm that there are more than two genders. Some scholars say there are some, as many as 60. Others say more than 100. And there are people who identify as a different gender that is different than what they are born with and, and are competing in athletics and as their gender of choice. The world, I'll, I point these things out just to say, man, the world as we thought we knew it has changed. And it's not just in the seven years. Man, it began long ago in our country, but we today, you, Generation Z, you're really experiencing the rapid changes of a revolution that happens when base, basic truth is left out of popular culture and education which honestly leaves us with where we're at today. Now, Barner, Barner Group, an independent research firm who has done and continues to do extensive research, more research than really anybody, on Generation, G, Generation Z stated that about a third or 33% of teens know someone who is transgender. And the majority, 69%, say it's acceptable to be born one gender and to feel like another. Now, is that true of the student population here at the Overflow? Probably not, but it's still, it remains that you are interacting with people every day who believe these things. And it all comes down really to this one question I know that you are faced with. Are gender and sexuality the, the choice of an individual or are they defined by God and are they God's choice for us? And which is what, this, this is the question that we're going to be answering today. And we will look at how the world views things and then look at how image, as, as image bearers of God, people made in the image of God, how we are supposed to look at gender and sexuality. Now, before we go into this, I, I've got to warn you, if you're not someone who believes in Jesus, who hasn't put your faith in Jesus as your Savior, then you're probably, you might have a hard time with some of the things I'm going to say and some of the things that we're going to go through. In fact, it doesn't even matter what I say unless you believe in God, the creator of the universe and receive his words as truth. If you do receive him and his word, then you will begin being transformed by him and, and be conformed to his image, the imago Dei we were created with. If not, as Romans 1 talks about and tells us, you will suppress the truth and exchange it for a lie, and God will hand you over to the depraved mind that you choose. Our identity, my friends, first has to be found in the fact that we are children of God. Now, I've got two points for us today. That's it, all right? And I pray that these two points would lead us closer to God and to a more godly and holy view of gender and sexuality. And the two points are this. Gender and sexuality are God's choice. And then if, to, to answer that, we say how we can live out that truth. Those are the two things we're going to look at. But first, let's pray as we go into this. Father, thank you. Thank you for being a God who is so involved. God, thank you. Despite what the world might be telling us, Lord, Thank you for giving us your word. Lord, the, the nourishment that we need for our souls, the guide for us of how we ought to live life so that we can live as you created us to live. 
Lord, thank you that your, your word talks about these things that we're not left in this murky gray area, Lord, but there is truth and scripture that speaks to us today as it did to the Romans thousands of years ago and to other sinners been thousands of years before that. Father, I do pray that as we go through this message that you would give me grace and you would give me humility to talk through this subject well. God, that these words wouldn't even be my own, but that they would be your words, Father. Lord, we love you so much. Would this be a conversation that in, in just inspires truth inside of us and it would, that you would give us the courage we need to, to live it out? We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's hop right into this. Now, before we address point number one, I think we need to have some common language so that we can address these topics. That way we know we are talking about the same things. Now, today I'm going to be using the word transgender. And now the, the definition I'm using is as follows. Transgender is, is being used as an umbrella term for people who are born either male or female, but whose gender identity differs from their birth sex at any degree and who wants to express their gender with which they identify through cross-dressing or hormone, cross-sex hormone therapy, if not also even going as far as sex reassignment surgery. Now, transgender would include anyone who might identify as bi-gender, pan-gender, omni-gender, gender fluid, or gender diverse. It's a very broad term, but this is what I'm talking about when I say that word. Another word I think we need to have a common definition on is sexuality. Now, when we say sexuality, I'm referring to one's identity with regards to who they are typically attracted to. For example, heterosexuality would mean a man and a woman being sexually attracted to each other. Homosexuality would mean people of the same gender feeling attracted to one another. Now, having some common language will be super helpful as we discuss these topics. So with that cleared up, let's hop right into it. Point number one on your notes is this. Gender and sexuality are God's choice. Gender and sexuality are God's choice. Now, John Piper, a famous pastor and theologian, really involved in these conversations, in his article on sexual identity, posed this question and gave a small answer stating this. He says, Is my sex determined by my decision in my mind or by God's design in my nature? That is the key question. We live in a day when individual autonomy, personal preference or choice, is considered by many to have priority over God's design. That may be because they don't believe in God or more often because they don't believe God has spoken with any kind of governing clarity on an issue. What John Piper does is he points out the big question being asked to you from the world, which is, what do you want to identify as? The choice is up to you. It's how you feel. That's what the world has said. The world says, as is evidenced by pop culture, education systems, etc., that however you feel... Man, that, that's fact for you. If you are born a boy, but you feel more like a girl, then follow that feeling. You can be a girl. The world says that if you are a boy, but are attracted to a boy, that's totally fine. Since it's how you feel, go ahead and live it out. Gender is just a spectrum, and male and female are just two options. These are the things that the world and pop culture are telling us today. In fact, it's more like the new normal. And then it goes so far as to say, if you don't accept that, then it's considered hate speech. If you deny, if you deny that, that you believe in that same, same thought, you're considered to be a bigot or homophobic or transphobic or whatever these different words that people want to put on you, which I believe, man, you probably experience this feeling, this tension, because it leaves Christians at a really tough place. We either have to conform to what the world says and begin to believe it, or we're forced with having to stand up with, for what God says about it. Because here's the deal, my friends. God does say things about it. God's word does have something to say about this. And it's very, very different from the world. To see this, we need to not to go to any other verses than the ones we've already talked about. We can go back to Genesis 1, 26-27, how it says we are made in the image of God. And it says in verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Get this, male and female, he created them. Pointing out that last part, male and female, he created them. And with this verse, it is super important to understand that when God is saying this, it's before the fall, right? One author I was commenting on this topic writes, the implication of these texts is plain. God created no third sex. This was not only the case before humanity's fall into sin, but remains the case after the fall as we would see in Genesis 5 later on. Not only does God in his creation say this, 
But Jesus says that when he was on earth and speaking with some Pharisees about divorce, he stated, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? He says that in Mark 10. So what is God saying in his word? What he is saying is that male and female, man and woman, are not two extremes at either end of a broad continuum or spectrum, but that God made human beings male and female and only either male or female. Now, now some people would argue that what you're talking about is biological sex. Gender and they'd say gender and biological sex are different. That's something the world is starting to push on us. You might be born a certain sex, but that doesn't mean that is your gender. The problem is that, that God doesn't differentiate the two. This is proven by reading the next chapter of Genesis. In Genesis 2, he's finishing the, the, the creation of man and woman. And one author writes, explaining, he says, we move from humanity being described in terms of the adjectives, male and female, which are not unique to humans, but also apply to animals, right? Kind of a, a male dog or a female dog. And he moves to the nouns, man and woman. If we had time, we'd get into the Hebrew of that. If you ever want to talk about that, I'd love to sit down and nerd over that with you. But this is where we move in Genesis 2. And Genesis 2.24, it states, therefore a man which again, we'll get into the Hebrew if you ever wanted that, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. The clear implication, the author writes, of this move from male and female to man and woman confirmed in tons of other places in the scripture is that a person's biological sex reveals and determines both their gender, what gender they in fact are, and certain key gender roles should they be taken up. That is, human males grow into men who could possibly become fathers or, or, or sons. And human females grow into women who could become mothers or wives. In summary, the author writes, a person's biological sex reveals and determines their actual gender and certain pretend, potential gender roles. And this, my friends, when we talk about the image of God, this is how God created us to be. This is what God's word says. So with regards to gender, we really are stuck with two options, as again, John Piper pointed out. Either you, as an individual, decides what gender you are, or God, as creator of all things, is the decider of your gender, either male or female. And now much of the same goes for sexuality. When it comes to attraction, that same question Piper po uh, poses valid. Say that ten times fast. Piper poses valid. Do I decide who I can have relations with or does God? Well, to answer this, man, let's, let's go back to the scripture. Let's go back to Romans 1. Paul again talked about how in verse 27, women exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. He says, in the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men. And what Paul is doing, he's pointing out how the women exchanged or gave up natural relations for unnatural ones. And men abandoned natural relations with women. He's saying that the nature that God had created man and woman to have is that men would have a, a man would have a sexual relationship with a woman, and he gave that up and were inflamed with lust or sexual attraction for one another. Now, what Paul is doing, he's pointing out clearly how this goes against the way God created sexuality. God created sexuality and sex to be between one man and one woman. And so does God have something to say about sexuality? I mean, I, I, after reading that, yeah, I would say that he does. Now, all that to say, God is the creator. We are made and created in his image. And so then God, as creator, and us as image bearer, man, God is the decider of our gender and our sexuality. As image bearers, then we ought to reflect the image that God has portrayed for us. But here lies the problem that I think that some of you might face, but also you probably know a lot of people who are, are facing this. What happens when your feelings differ from God's word? What happens even though you are a woman, you feel more like a man? Isn't that feeling valid? Now, I've, I've got to say this first. Yes, your, feeling, your feelings are real, 100%. I'm never going to stand up here and say, you know what, no, those feelings are fake. Nobody actually has that feeling. You don't know what you're talking about. You're just confused. No, I think those feelings are real. But here's the deal, but just because they are real, it doesn't mean that they're true. And we've all got feelings to do things that we know are outside of God's call, or what God calls us to do. When a person has a feeling inside them to say like murder, 
So you go to Genesis chapter 4 and you see how Adam and Eve had sons named Cain and Abel and Cain go in and he killed his brother. That was a real feeling that, that, that Cain had, that he wanted to kill his brother and he gave into that. But let me ask, but just because he had that feeling, does that automatically mean he has permission to do that? No. God punished Cain for his actions because it went against what God had created him to be, which is, which is called morality. Like we have this as, as human beings, this, this morality that God has given us, and it went against that, and so God punished Cain for that. Or even we look at King David, and he had the feeling to take Bathsheba as his own. Even though he knew that she was a married woman, he gave in to that feeling. Was that okay just because he wanted to commit adultery? Was that like, yeah, that's, that's totally fine. That's what he wanted. That's how he feels. No. It goes against what God had created and how God had created marriage to be between one man and one woman. And had to not take another man's wife in that time. Just because David felt that way, it didn't give him permission to do it. But he did it anyways, and he paid the consequences for his actions on earth. Let me, let me tell you, we got to be careful with this, but our, our feelings are real. But they're not always truth. Our feelings are only truth when what we feel is raised up against what God says is true and good, and they align when they're on the same thing. When we start having, so when it comes to these feelings that we are actually a different gender than the one God says that we are, that doesn't make it okay. When it comes to feelings that we are attracted to someone other than the opposite, opposite gender just because we have them, it doesn't mean that they're, that they're okay and that we should just give in to those feelings. Our feelings are real, but just because we feel something, it doesn't make it truth. Now, I know that that, that is a very, very different from how the world tells us what to think. But again, we appeal back to the fact that we are all created as an image bearer of a perfect God. And if we believe that and have confessed that his son Jesus is our savior and believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and then we are called to live inside of that image of God. We're saved and then we're called to now live being transformed by God. Now, is this easy? No, this isn't always easy. In fact, when I look at what you today are up against, man, my heart hurts. Because you're up against a powerful cultural movement that is trying to tell you the opposite of what God says through his character and through his word. And but as an image bearer of God who has salvation through Jesus, we also have the spirit of God inside of us. And that spirit, let me tell you, he's strong enough to help us live as the image bearer we are called to live as. Now, now let me say this, that as, as we've now established the difference between the two beliefs, right, of the world and of what God says, if you're watching this today, if you're listening to this, if you struggle with same-sex attraction or with confusion with regards to gender, whatever it is, it doesn't mean that you somehow can't know Jesus. That just because you've had these thoughts or that you're really in the middle of this, that, oh, you know what, you're automatically cast out. Man, let me tell you, I've got friends who believe in Jesus, who are following Jesus, who fight daily with some of these things, but the key word is a fight that they daily fight some of the feeling. They have to daily fight some of the feelings that they have because as they've measured up these feelings up against God and his, against his word, they've realized that they're not true, that they're against the way that God has called, him, called them to bear his image. They don't just give in to them. What they've done is they've asked for help from parents, from friends, from pastors, from leaders. They go to good Christian counselors who help them work through these feelings. I've got friends in the church who know people who struggle with this but are still able to get married as God intended marriage and have good and fulfilling marriages and lives. And this is where I think we pick up for, on the second part of this message. So if, if this is the truth, that God is the one who decides our sexuality and our gender, then how can we live it out? Point number two on your notes is how can we live out that truth? If you struggle with this, man, my challenge to you, first and foremost, and come and ask for help. Don't wait. Your leader, me, your pastor, guess what? I'm not going to judge you if you say, hey, David, I'm struggling with some of these things. I'm really, really hurting, and I don't know why I'm having these questions and these thoughts. I'm not going to look. This might be your fear. You might think, like, oh, I'm going to judge you, and I'm going to just say, hey, everybody, look at this person. They're struggling with this. I can promise you 100%. I'm not going to say that. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look you in the eyes, and I'm going to say, okay, let's walk through this together. 
and I'm going to point you in the right direction to get help. I'm going to help you as much as I can, and I'm going to point you and remind you the fact that you are beautiful and made in the image of God, and that God loves you, and that He sees you, and that He wants a relationship with you, and that He isn't giving up on you, and that He wants to walk with you alongside this life so that you can know Him more, and that you can walk in obedience. As Pastor Daniel even talked about a couple weekends ago, man, God is for you and what He's calling you to do and what He's calling you to be which means God is for you in the image bearing that he's calling you to to, to do. I can promise you that. So if that's you today, man, talk to us. Tell your leader. Talk to me. Let us help you and walk through this life with you. Or maybe you yourself, you aren't struggling with yourself, but are struggling with 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 what to believe for yourself about these things. Let me encourage you to first do this, okay? Understand. It's okay to stand firm in God's word and what God says in love. Now, I want to be clear on this. We just talked about how God's word is the definer of what we believe. How we don't take things for our feelings as facts, but we take God's word as the truth that guides us. We must never compromise on this. We must never take compromises when it comes to truth. But here's what we need to know. Contrary to what the world says and what media tries to make people believe, You can stand up for truth and disagree with someone. You can do it. And you can still love them. The world says that if you actually love someone, you would support everything they do. After all, they are living their truth. What's wrong with that? But we know that as believers, man, God calls us to a life of of loving Him and following Him in everything that He does. We can't compromise that truth. But that doesn't mean that we cannot still love people doesn't mean that you can't love the people at your school. Here are a few things that you can do to stand firm in God's word, yet still love those that are around you. First thing is, man, you can't love someone that you, you, you don't understand or that you don't even make an attempt to understand. So one of the first things that we can do is to try and understand the person struggling with transgenderism or, or sexuality confusion. Now, what do I mean by this? I mean that you have got to understand that what your friend or you are experiencing is very, very real to them. One of the, the worst things that we could do is undermine or mock the feelings of friend or even someone that you know is struggling with. Your dismissal of their feelings to them comes off as a dismissal of their reality, of their very being. So man, if we really want to love someone, seek to understand. Just because you, you can understand maybe some of the things that you do doesn't make it right, but you can still try to bear with them and understand some of the things that they're coming with to establish some sort of common ground so that you can even have an avenue to talk about Jesus and what God says. Another thing you can do, man, this is a big one. You can be careful of the language that you are using. Now, I mean, be intentional, I mean, intentional about not using words such as, as gay or trans or other synonyms of those words as insults. And even if it's in a joking manner to you, it isn't to your friend that might be struggling with this or identify differently than you. When you use those word, man, it's hurtful to them. It really is. And and let me say, how sad would it be if a word that we use, even in a joke, caused so much hurt to someone that completely turned them off to the gospel? That they wouldn't even know who Jesus is because of one word that we use. It's not worth it. We have to be careful with the words that we use. I read an article as I was preparing for this on how we can love someone intentionally as Christians by a man named Alan Shalmon. He writes for a blog called Stand to Reason, and he speaks more towards someone who is transgender, but I believe that we can take everything he's saying and apply it to those who might be struggling with sexuality too. And I'm going to read these five tips for loving well. <clears throat> Point number one, he says, is this. Make your friendship a high priority. He says, if your friend identifies as transgender, move towards them, not away from him. Relationships are bridges that allow us to show love, tell the truth, express compassion, or share the gospel. Too often, transgender people or people struggling with sexuality feel alienated from Christians. But by pursuing your friendship with them, you'll communicate your love for them. Something discussed in the next principle. Point number the second principle is this, love them. Transgender people desperately need our love. Let me say that one more time. Those struggling with their sexual identity and transgenderism, they need our, Christians, they need our love. Startling data suggests that 41% of transgender people attempt to commit suicide. 41%. 
that's much higher than the 1.6% of the rest of the population who attempt suicide. And our transgender friends and friends struggling with sexuality, they're, so they're hurting inside. They're hurting. Knowing this truth should motivate us towards compassion. Loving them should seem obvious advice, but it's often forgotten. When Christians remember to love, they often express it by telling their transgender friends, and I, I kid you not, I've heard this, I've seen other friends do this, they look at them and say, hey, God loves this sinner but hates the sin. But the problem with saying this, I know the intention behind that is good. It's acknowledging like, you know what, like we're all sinners. God hates sin, but he loves us. But, but the problem is when we say that as the first thing we do, the only word they hear is hate. They think you hate them and God hates them too. Although you use the cliche with the intention of communicating love, it produces the opposite effect. If you want your transgender friends to know you and, and God and you want them to love you, don't say something, do something. Love them. Show them you love them by your actions. Treat them the same way you treat your friends. Well, well, that will show you your love for them. And since you're a Christian, that God loves them too. Remember, it's Christians, more than secular culture, who should show love to transgender people. The secular culture shouldn't be telling Christians how to love people. Christians should be telling the popular culture, hey, this is how you love people, and we're going to model that. It's our worldview that teaches that everyone, including people who identify as transgender, get this, are made in God's image, intrinsically valuable, and deserving of dignity and respect. The third principle is this. Be wise with names and pronouns. Okay, now I'm going to be careful with this one, but, but pay attention. So the question is, is often posed, should you call your transgender friends by the names slash pronouns they give themselves, assuming those names, pronouns are different, are gendered opposite of their biology? And this is probably the most complex and controversial question. And my answer is this. He says, it depends. It depends. Ask yourself, am I a trusted influence and a loving friend to them? If the answer is no, then you are not the one who should try to correct them. Call them by whatever name they ask you to call them. This would apply to most acquaintances, whether at school, work, or a social gathering. Or, how about this? Could I avoid using a pronoun at all and just say their name? Call them by the name that they say their name is. You don't have to maybe always use the pronoun. Maybe you just call them by their name. If, however, you are in a close friendship with someone who now claims that they are transgender, then I would say it's fair to discuss your feelings about the matter with each other if you have that close personal relationship. This principle is similar to the one we follow at church. You as a believer were not called to speak into every other Christian's life. You may know of a sin committed by a Christian, but that doesn't mean you're the person who should admonish him. We reserve accountability or loving criticism for close friendships, family, our pastor, or leader, or accountability partner. We even follow the same principle with non-Christians. If you hear a stranger at the gas station swear, you don't look around and say, hey, hey, don't be cussing, right? We don't do that. Or, or even with someone who, 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 like, you don't rebuke an acquaintance at school or work or someone you meet at a party. We reserve such relationships with people we're close to, people who trust us because we know, they know that we care for them. I'm su suggesting that we apply a similar approach to transgender people. I want to add, though, that if you do develop a deeper relationship with this person, it can be a spirit-led conversation depending on how receptive that person is to you and the gospel and who God says they are. So if you're trying to make that decision whether you should talk to someone about that, man, come talk to me. I'd love to walk through that and discern through that with you. Principle number four, don't put family rules on those outside the family. Don't put family rules on those outside the family. What do we mean? He says we can't expect non-Christians to act like Christians. Paul talks about this in his letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5, 9-13. You can go read that later. We might long for our non-believing friends and family to live by biblical standards, but we shouldn't try to make that the focus of our relationship. Believers are called to hold other believers, those inside the church, to biblical standards. Those who are confessing believers, we're, calling, we're called to hold them to biblical standards. God is responsible for judging those outside the church. Instead of trying to manage your transgender friend's behavior, focus on a higher purpose, which is the next principle, which is principle number five. Make Jesus the issue. Man, instead of trying to, to make your transgender friends follow you biblical guidelines, make it your goal to invite them to follow the Jesus of Nazareth. After all, being transgender should not be, like, being transgender should not be your ultimate focus. Even if your transgender friends return to the gender of their biology, their eternal destiny is still in jeopardy. Your hope for your transgender friends should not be to change their gender identity, but their spiritual identity. We want them to accept the gospel. And once the Holy Spirit indwells them, 
He will transform them from the inside out. And that transformation, by the way, will not be merely a change in their body, but a change in their soul. So my friends, as we close, our hope and goal as believers made in the Imago Dei, the image of God, is not to just struggle with our sexuality, not to just not struggle with our sexuality or gender, or for our friends, loved ones to just not struggle with their sexuality or gender. Our hope is that they would come to know Jesus, the Savior of all humanity, the one who is sent by God the Father, willingly took on all our sin and died on the cross for us, making a payment we couldn't make, rising again three days later after conquering death so that we too, if we believe in him as our Lord and our Savior, confess that with our mouth and believe he rose from the dead, that we could have eternal life with the Father too and live out the purpose he's given us. That's the goal. So my friends, as we go throughout this world, may we live confidently as image bearers of God, fighting to hold to the truth and living as ones called and loved and known by the Father. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time and, and, and for your word. God, I, I don't know where I would be personally if it wasn't for your word, for it constantly guiding me and showing me how to love you and to, 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 to follow you. Father, I know that the students that are listening to this, that there might be some of them there that are struggling with this. And I know that they might feel alone right now. Father, wherever they're at, I pray that they would feel your presence right now. That they would hear so clearly the calling out of their name by you. How, Lord, you're calling them to know you. That you don't want them to go and fix themselves and then come to you, but God, you want them just as they are and that you will work through everything else after that. So, Father, I pray that these students are there, Lord, that they would just, that they would acknowledge that they call out to you as their Savior. That if they want to talk more about that, they'd reach out to me too. Father, I pray for the rest of our students who are struggling with what to believe and are being influenced by what the culture is telling them to believe. Lord, would they stand firm in what your word says and would they do that in love? We love you, Jesus, so much. And we pray, amen. If you ever need to talk about these things, again, my friend, we're here for you. We're not going to leave you. My contact info is going to be on the screen. Shoot me an email. Give me a call. And I would love to sit down and hear your story, your struggle, and just get to know you so that we can build a relationship and learn more about Christ. We hope you'll join us next week as we continue on this series of Mega Imago Dea. We love you. Have a good one. Mm-hmm.